you are joining me for the first time please remember to click subscription button and hit that notification bell to be the first person to receive the video that will be produced by devtech media devtech media updating you devtech media subscribe to devtech media Hey friends, welcome to DevTech Media, your number one news channel. I'm your host and producer, Luchinbi David. If you're really joining me for the first time, please don't forget to click that subscription button and that notification bell. Thank you for tuning in at DevTech Media. Remember, this is the channel that will produce news, trending videos, political news, gospel music, as well as entertainment. Today's update, please take a look at this video. Watch. Uh, uh, the rest of the team, uh, the special assistant to the president, advice uh, on COVID, Dr. Roma Chilengi, and uh, very shortly we expect that we shall be joined by Mr. Jito Kayumba, who is also the Special Assistant to the President, and advice uh, on economic affairs. Uh, in addition to that, we, uh, we have been joined by our first, uh, our first analyst, uh, Mr. Frederick Sevenzi. And I expect that uh, Mr. Brian Winger will be here. We also have uh, our chief analyst, uh, Madam Cecilia Mumbashi. Ladies and gentlemen uh, of the media, the Auditor General's Office has just recently published the report of the accounts of the Republic for the financial year ended 31st December 2020. And from this report, Two lines of audit findings very clearly stand out. Number one, the failure to follow the current procedures. This has spiked from 504,500 in 2019 to a figure of 234 million 70,294 in the year 2020. Number two, wasteful expansion. This has spiked an exponentially so from a figure of 3,730,864 in 2019 to an astonishing figure of 1,407,500,000 in 2020. Now, In these two great instances, as is the case in all other instances that have been reported and published in the Auditor General's uh, report, the country, and incidentally the Zambian people, are losing money. And with that, they are losing opportunities for jobs, public health care, education, social protection, and amongst to several. And this is deeply concerning to the President. Mr. Hagaide Hitchin. Now, the President's long standing view is that in order for us to expand and expedite the delivery of social and economic dividends to the Zambian people, we must rein in, and I'm going to emphasize, we must rein in on public procurement fraud, a trend and advice deeply entrenched at the heart of how public procurement systems work in our country. And to this effect, the President has provided both leadership and guidance on this matter. And this leadership and guidance stands as follows. That all public procurement of goods, services and works must apply and therefore meet these three basic requirements. Number one, the right price. Number two, value for money in terms of the quality subsequently delivered. Number three, the timely delivery of these public goods, services, and works as public agencies uh, may procure from time to time. And to this effect, Cabinet Office has since issued Secular Number 4 of 2021, which compels all government procurement agencies, personnel, as well as controlling officers, 
to comply with the above guidance without reserve. Otherwise, there will be consequences as has been outlined in Secular Number 4 of 2021 20, issued by Cabinet Office. Now, further to this, the Zambia Public Procurement Authority, through the Office of the Director General, has also been guided as follows. Number one, that they must expedite the completion of the price benchmarking exercise in line with Section 62 of the Public Procurement Act. Number two, that they must publish on a quarterly basis the benchmark prices in line with Section 12, subsection, subsection 3 of the Public Procurement Act. This is very important. Now, let me emphasize that the President means business, absolutely means business, on the need to reform how public procurement works in this country. And that those who will dare sidestep his leadership and guidance on the needs to reform public procurement and how the procurement of public goods, services and works should and must absolutely work in this country, Again, I must say, there will be consequences, as have been outlined in Secular Number 4 um, uh, of 2021, issued by the Cabinet Office. Um, this Secular is, in, is instructive. The President's guidance and leadership on this matter is instructive, and everyone is expected and must comply with this leadership and guidance on our public procurement must ensure the reform without reserve. Now, another issue, that is a gentleman of the media, uh, which continues to be of great concern to the President, as it should be of concern to all of us, is the devastating COVID-19 pandemic and its effects, uh, not just on the economy, uh, but also on our collective well-being and also the structure uh, of, of, of our social lives. And in this regard, I want to, to make way very, very quickly for Mr. Jito Kayumba, who's just joined us. Um, and again, Mr. Jito Kayumba is a special assistant to the President for Economics Affairs, and uh, he's going to highlight some of the effects um, of COVID-19 on the economy. And after that, I shall proceed to make some way for uh, Dr. Roma Chibeni, who is a special assistant to the President and advisor on covid to uh, uh, inform us a bit more on this subject matter. Uh, Mr. Bayou. Thank you very much, Anthony, and greetings to you all, colleagues from the media. It's always important that we continue to actively engage with you so that you are fully aware, fully informed of what this administration is doing for, this, for the benefit of the Zambian people. Um, one thing that was of great importance, and if you don't mind if I take my mask off, I'm not posing any danger to anyone here. Um, you know, one thing that we need to bring back into perspective is the fact that you know, COVID is, is real, is, is very much a reality. We know that the numbers have fallen quite significantly, but as, it's, as we've seen before, there's been multiple waves. Um, and, and as you are well aware, that many, many of our loved ones passed away during the past uh, period in which COVID came into existence. Obviously, what's of concern to, to and particularly my role in, in the purview that I have, which is economic and development, um, we saw obviously had a massive impact uh, you know, on the economy. And bringing, back, bringing this back into perspective really pushes us into thinking around how we mitigate it. And of course, as an administration, uh, you know, the president obviously uh, opted to bring in a COVID advisor who's obviously uh, supremely competent. And of course, we look forward to his. Is updates now from of course these are these are factors you've heard before um, at an economic level from a GDP perspective you know it's COVID induced a recession uh, across the world and we know that the potential for it to continue to suppress economic growth is still very much uh, ahead of us and with what experts are saying okay, there's a likelihood of a fourth wave now we know that in the past prior to the wave coming through there's been a bit of a relaxation in COVID um, now we want to be prepared for that, and, and obviously of optimal concern is, is that of 
you know, the economic impact. And we, we obviously don't want uh, a continued recession. Now, we, we witnessed the reduction in trade activity, in trade volumes, given the fact that from the, you know, commercial activity depends largely on you know, personal engagement, of course, uh, dealing with supply chains, Zambia is largely an import dependent economy. And of course, when you have supply chain disruptions, which is one of the key factors that COVID brought, uh, you know, it's very, there's a lot less, not only consumption, but of course, transactions taking place in the economy. And not really to belabor the point on how it impacted, we, we are fully aware of what it did to the tourism sector, to mineral production, to our fiscal revenues, uh, of course, uh, resulting also largely in job losses, as well as closure of businesses. Now the impact really comes down to the household, where people's livelihoods are affected. And our primary concern from an economic standpoint is how do we address ways in which we we enable citizens of Zambia to have a, an income, a gainful income that allows for them to or sustainably support their families and live fulfilled lives. That's ultimately what economics is about. Now the way forward, in, in, of course, from an economic standpoint, is, is really, other than bringing back macro stability, we heard uh, the Minister of Finance's comments on, on the economy, pretty much a broad view. Of course, there'll be more details coming up in, uh, in, in the coming weeks. Greater detail, but really an emphasis and something we're very excited about. I just thought I should share with you about you know private sector led growth. You know because the private sector is truly where the, the economic engine of any economy, particularly across the world, those pros, prosperous countries where we see the thriving economy, you find that it's, it's driven by small businesses, businesses that are highly capitalized, businesses that are connected to to, to supply chain with access to market, uh, businesses that have technical assistance and have an enabling environment that allows for them to thrive. And that is needed, even in the context of COVID. And of course, you know, we should be wary of the fact that you know, we also need to think differently as a government, uh, with, in conjunction with the mine ministries, health, commerce, small and uh, medium-sized business development, uh, which is also a new uh, ministry, which is a clear indication of our commitment to build uh, you know, the private sector, build small businesses, and also, most importantly, have inclusive economic growth. Uh, from a, another intervention that we have to prepare for as we look at ways to draw resources, find the most domestic resource mobilization, seeing that we are in a, in a very difficult uh, fiscal position, is how we engage with the international community, with cooperating partners, in an intelligent way. Um, one that is not debt-driven, but one that uh, leverages on the, their capacities and, and goodwill. Um, fiscal stimulus can come out of that. When COVID hits, we heard of countries where finances were put into the economy that allowed for, for businesses to somewhat have some sort of a buffer. So as people were spending less, you know, there was access to a degree of, of financing from, you know, from, from sort of soft providers of, of funds, whether it be through grants or even low interest uh, loans. Um, and really getting businesses to not only cope with the difficulties of COVID, but then also how to pivot, right? You know, when you have certain restrictions imposed, there has to be ways in which, you know, products and services can still get to the consumer um, in, a, in an intelligent way without, you know, of course, the ideas have to come from obviously the, the market and we want to be able to embrace that and create mechanisms and how we support that. Now, this is really just to set the stage for you know, my colleague, uh, Dr. Roma Chilengi, who's, uh, as I mentioned before, eminently qualified to, to, not, to, to really lead our efforts from a COVID perspective, and really to remind the, the people, and the market, the media, and everybody out there about you know, what COVID means from a economic standpoint, and prepare for us to sort of reposition ourselves as a, as a country that is prepared to deal with it, where our people are not only fully vaccinated, but are responding to, to the initiatives that, that are likely to be put in place, or that will be put in place, in order to really save this economy for, for the betterment of the world. Thank you for this opportunity, Dr. Elenke. Over to you. Good afternoon, colleagues. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you, Chief. I've been introduced already. I'm um, um, singularly focused on the subject of uh, uh, COVID mitigation. Um, I think it is fresh in all our minds that at this point, there is no Zambian who has not been infected or affected 
by COVID. I think we all know of someone that is close to us that we have either lost or that has become sick for a long time in the hospital and unfortunately others who have become essentially incapacitated after suffering an episode of, of COVID and they are not as functional as they perhaps were before the COVID hit. The issues that um, my colleagues have talked about, and the President is very clear about the fact that while we have a detailed and comprehensive economic recovery plan, all aspects of that plan are threatened by the risk of uh, a COVID outbreak. I think you would recall that uh, all economic activities, including education and, and, and even religious activities, had to be halted because of the uh, COVID outbreak. And to this end, we know that while we are coming out of uh, the third wave of COVID, we anticipate that a fourth wave might hit um, in the coming months if not weeks. Therefore, we have to organize ourselves and be wise and come up with business unusual in terms of how we prepare for um, the, the expected uh, fourth wave. In our view, there are two things that we need to look at. There is the immediate aspect of how we should prepare for the COVID um, uh, uh, epidemic right now. And there is the longer term view of the things that we need to put in our public spaces, in our health system, so that we can handle uh, this uh, 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 scale moving forward. Among the very many things that have been done, as you know, we talk about the golden rules and, 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 and vaccination, um, is the fact that to benefit particularly from the vaccine, you need a large proportion of the population vaccinated. That is how you stop um, an epidemic from uh, spreading in a given community. In our case, um, in spite of the uh, impact of the third wave, we have not done well in terms of vaccination. Uh, we had initial challenges with availability of the vaccine, but when the vaccine came, what we saw was that during the third wave, mainly driven by the fear of people witnessing their loved ones go down to COVID, we had a bit of increased demand that people online. As we speak today, our coverage um, of vaccination is way, way low target. The intention was to vaccinate up to 10% of the adult population by 30 September. By that date, we had hardly vaccinated 3% of the target population. And if you see information that is out in the public, we've not done well as a country. Therefore, while we are now in a period where the third wave is waning out and is getting a fourth wave, it is time to act. It is time to be very affirmative. It is time to move deliberately and intentionally and one of the key issues that I think you would agree with is, is that we did not, in the previous experience, uh, demonstrate strong leadership on the matter. This administration is very categorical, uh, as exemplified by my appointment at State House, that we have to take the matter of COVID as a national priority. And in doing so, we are working towards a relaunch of the vaccine program tomorrow. And we want to 
demonstrate to the country that this is an important matter and in doing that the head of state himself is going to lead that activity together with other public leaders we are talking about other leaders in government members of parliament um, opposition leaders traditional leaders religious leaders and various um, uh, community stakeholders that need to come to the table and agree that at the moment vaccination is the hope we have in mitigating the fourth wave of COVID. We are hoping that tomorrow we will send a strong message that it starts from the top to lead the vaccine campaign and each and every individual at whatever level of leadership they have will now be expected to demonstrate leadership because it would have been demonstrated from the top. Line ministers will be expected to demonstrate leadership in their ministries. Various leaders in their organizations will be expected to demonstrate leadership down to the household level. We expect each one of us, as a father in my house, I have to demonstrate leadership. And in this case, we are really hoping that uh, uh, the message of getting vaccinated will be taken very seriously. And uh, this is one way in which, in fact, I dare say, the only way in which we can reasonably anticipate that come the fourth wave, we will not get into a lockdown. Remember, ladies and gentlemen, uh, when COVID hits, UTH mortuary got full. The hospital facilities in Levy and everywhere else were full. Oxygen supply was limited and we did run out of oxygen. That is not the kind of scenario we want to go back to in the coming weeks and months. And therefore, we have an opportunity here where government has put its muscle down, put its resources down to provide vaccines for its people and expect people to reciprocate by taking up this vaccine. If you don't want to take it for yourself, you can take it for your neighbor. We are looking forward to a future where we can take off the masks, we can hug, we can meet in public spaces safely. But we simply cannot do that when the population continue to shun methods that will help us attain that. So this is going to be a strong appeal and a strong signal and a demonstration that this is something we must all do. And uh, we hope that uh, each one of us, including yourselves as journalists, you will get vaccinated if you are not yet vaccinated. The details of the rest of the uh, strategy against COVID will unfold as we go by in the coming days and weeks. But the vaccine effort taking preeminence is something that we have moved forward to relaunch tomorrow. And kindly not, we are saying relaunch because vaccination activities already started, but perhaps they started with a strategy that was not that effective and we are hoping that this re 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 renewed effort will be much more effective and will have better numbers to show as a country that is at peace, as a country that has uh, uh, reasoning systems and workable uh, uh, mechanisms. Uh, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Please come, sir. Testing. I'm Shemina Nando from uh, 
Diamond TV. My question is to Dr. Chelenke. We've seen uh, just over the weekend government deciding to open up uh, rather ease the restrictions that were imposed during uh, the climax of the COVID-19 pandemic. It's spoke about uh, the reduced number of uh, uh, tests that we've conducted, just about 3 to 4 percent. Just want to get the government's thinking in this regard and also if this relaunch does receive overwhelming response from members of the public, do we have the capacity to vaccinate all those that will be willing? Thank you. Thank you, Chibon. Next question, please. Good afternoon, my name is Chris Carlomingo from Millennium Radio. Uh, my question goes to the special advisor of COVID-19. Uh, my question is, in antici anticipation of the fourth wave, as a country, how prepared are we in terms of drugs, PPEs, as well as oxygen? Thank you very much. Um, we'll take one extra one before I make way for uh, Dr. Chilemi to start responding. Right, so good afternoon, and uh, my name is uh, Innocent Perry, coming from uh, Movement Revision. Um, my question is as common as it has just been always. It's uh, regarding how the UPND administration uh, is going to contain the pressure in terms of uh, the marketeers as well as uh, those that are trading from the streets, vis a vis with regards to the compliance levels of these measures that are being put in place. I think for a long time we have discovered that we have not seen much control uh, by you know, our leaders in managing our people in the markets as well as bus stations. The issue of wearing masks has been a challenge and sanitizing has been a challenge as well. How different are we going to, to make as European administration with regards to managing these uh, people in the areas of destination? Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, let me make way for uh, Dr. Schlenke to bring in on these questions. Um, thank you, Anthony. Um, Dan asks um, about um, restrictions that uh, we lifted only a few days ago. So, the, the rights and privileges of the population are really a human rights issue and they do get overridden by law uh, given invoking specific statutory instruments that speak to protection of the public in the interest of public health. So we've had these restrictions invoked um, during the third wave with limitations of, of gathering and the conditions that went with that. And that is not um, implemented as a matter of fun or exercising power. It is implemented in the interest of public health, in the interest of the threat that is imminent. And the COVID infections going down in the manner that they have required, of course, that the restrictions that were imposed because of the upset in COVID in infections be reversed. It is a matter of taking responsibility to reverse certain restrictions because the circumstances right now are such that the infection is not ready. Now, get me clear. This is not a green light to now open up. Should the epidemic come back again, then your government will come back and impose restrictions. But if the government is imposing restrictions and not lifting them, how then will they be able to impose further restrictions in future? So this is a very basic issue that restrictions were imposed and the conditions have now settled down. Those restrictions needed to be lifted. Now, if the public 
does not want further restrictions moving forward, this is why we are saying we need to take further preventive methods, uh, particularly get vaccinations going, so that should the fourth wave come, those numbers will not force us into restrictions. The moment we start getting restrictions, that's how we end up in a lockdown, which then undermines the economic activity that my colleagues are talking about. So we have to do our best now that the restrictions have been lifted, now that we are able to move and interact a bit more freely, uh, that uh, we prepare ourselves. Come forth with, we have in, in good numbers vaccinated, then we will not go into more restrictions. We will continue to observe the golden rules, we will continue to increase our vaccine coverage, but hopefully we don't get to a point where we have to shut down, because should the infection rage through our, our society, we have to shut down. So please get this clearly, that the restrictions have been lifted because the infections have gone down. And while the infections are down, we need to behave ourselves, we need to do the correct things, and we need to take preventive methods. Remember the old saying in English, prevention is always better than cure. It's always cheaper and easier than cure. And this is what we are trying to prepare for, so that if the infection comes in the fourth wave, we don't have to go to a shutdown. Um, Millennium Radio asks about uh, oxygen and other materials that we need uh, in dealing with an epidemic. It is true that um, at the height of the third wave, we run out of oxygen in this country. AFOX, which provides oxygen in cylinders, could not cope with the demand. As a matter of fact, there were not enough cylinders uh, to meet the number of patients who needed to be on oxygen. All the beds that were automatically connected to high flow oxygen in uh, UTH, Manawasa, and other facilities that have that capability were overwhelmed. I have no doubt in my, in my mind that many of you have relatives and loved ones uh, for whom you had to scrounge around for these things. So in the background, part of what we have to deal with is precisely prepare these kind of things. I must mention that there are advanced uh, plans around capacitating several frontline facilities with modern oxygen production plants. These are production plants that should be able to sustain high flow oxygen, uh, pipes stretch to the beds, but also have capacity to pump oxygen into cylinders uh, so that uh, other smaller facilities around may also uh, refill from there and benefit from that. In provinces like Osaka, which, uh, which, which, which are larger and uh, have more dense population, obviously we need more of these facilities. And as we spread countrywide, we need to make sure that within, reason, within reasonable distance, there is a facility that is providing um, uh, oxygen uh, in the interest of the smaller facilities around it that they may go and refill there. At this point, I can confirm that there are advanced plans, and some of which with uh, support from um, our cooperating partners, um, some of these plants are already funded, and it's a process of implementation they are going through, and uh, we are also very busy resource mobilizing so that we can make sure the country is covered, at least in each province, and uh, the, the, the larger facilities must be able to have oxygen production capacity. This is something that uh, uh, we are working very hard Hopefully, we can uh, be in a better position ahead of the fourth wave coming. Um, marketeers and uh, uh, bus stop vendors. Um, the COVID mitigation methods, the golden rules as we call them, unfortunately, they are largely dependent on human behavior in terms of make sure the mask is on, uh, distance, how can you even distance when you are sitting in a bus 
and there are four passengers on, on, on one seat. Um, hand washing, you know, and, and improved personal hygiene. These are methods that are dependent on human behavior. And medical history has it that any intervention that is entirely dependent on human behavior is a very difficult one to enforce at public level because you expect the people to comply by themselves. And we know that human beings will typically respond to fear and once the fear is removed, they go back to their ways. Um, the one thing though, among the interventions we have, that may require human behavior to comply only once is vaccination. And this is why we are focusing on vaccination. Because when you are vaccinated, you are given a shot in the arm, you go away, while we hope that you will do your best to mitigate your exposure, but you have something within you that is going to protect you against the possible infection. This is why vaccination is extremely important. It's because we are not going to get everybody to comply. We are not going to manage to get everybody to wear a mask. What's worse, even if you are wearing a mask, you have to wear it properly. So these behaviors are very, very difficult to enforce, and which is why we are, our key message is get vaccinated. So that if you are in the bus, you will feel safer if you know that uh, your neighbors are vaccinated as well, isn't it? So I think that the question asked here really is how different is our strategy going to be? And one of the challenges that, of course, we experienced in the past was that vaccines are given to healthy, productive people. And healthy, productive people are busy day by day engaging in their affairs for their livelihood. So if you are going to ask them to go get vaccinated, firstly, you need to give them enough information so that they are motivated to get vaccinated. And I think we all know that social media has been busy sending a lot of junk and unfortunately people are, are very good following junk. But so we need to be able to convince people that they, they have to be vaccinated. Okay? And when they are convinced, we need to make it easy for them to go get vaccinated. You then don't want to leave your, your bus if you are a driver to go and stand for three hours on the queue in order to get vaccinated. What you want is to find a 10 minute when you are waiting for your time to take passengers to dash to the vaccination facility, get the job and back to work. This is the productivity that we are looking for. And if we don't do that, unfortunately, instead of taking 10 minutes to go and get the job, you may get bedridden. Unfortunately for your family, you may lose your life and then, you know, you have an, an, an unimaginable uh, uh, circumstances for families. I think we all know that a lot of breadwinners were lost from the previous wave and we don't want a repeat of that. So get vaccinated is the key message. Thank you, Dr. Um, would that take the next uh, set of three questions, please? Yes, sir. My name is Christian Black, I write for Reuters. So what's your name? Uh, Christian Black, I write for Reuters. Um, what new vaccination targets have you set ahead of the fourth wave and beyond? Question. Good afternoon. Um, Joseph Damalibanda from JoyFM Radio and TV. Uh, my question is directed to your talk uh, over the COVID uh, situation. Uh, you made mention that uh, the strategy that was previously used, or that is still in force, uh, was not the correct one, and uh, you are going to do the relaunch of uh, the vaccination. Um, I would want to get clarity from you. The strategy that you referred to uh, was based on uh, voluntary 
And uh, if you are not getting the desired figures with regards to people being vaccinated, what have you put in place that will be so different or to appeal to people? My especially knowing that voluntary has not worked. Have you come up with a different uh, strategy away from the voluntary vaccination? Thank you very much. Uh, any other question? Yes, ma'am. If there won't be any other question after after this one, we shall proceed to concluding our press conference. Uh, that's perfect, but. Yes, the one is uh, to the dog. Yes, we have uh, know that there is a bit of a more resistive act there in the compound, actually in the entire country. So what measures are you putting in place so that at least people should understand the benefits attached to the COVID vaccine? Because many people walk away from these clinics because they haven't understood the information. Thank you very much. Dr. Uh, Shane? Um, thank you very much for those questions. Um, new vaccination targets. Um, I will not um, today commit to a specific target. I mentioned that uh, when the campaign for vaccination was launched, the intention, and th these were actually global targets, by the way, they were not Zaka specific targets, they were global targets within regions like ourselves in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, where we were expected to target at least up to 10% of the uh, uh, adult population by 30th September. We have not achieved that. And what we are hoping is to achieve that and then set new targets, depending on how effective our strategies are going to be. Um, ideally, um, I'm a vaccinologist myself. I'm actually a professor of vaccinology. I can tell you that for infectious diseases like, like COVID, what you do need is up to 70% of your target population vaccinated in order to keep it at bay. So you need very, very high targets. The modest targets that were set were in light of the fact that um, it's a new disease, it's a new health, uh, the health system is not um, uh, adequately prepared and there isn't sufficient vaccines. I think we all observed what happened shortly after we started. India had a massive outbreak and all the vaccines went to India and then there was a shortage of vaccines. So all those factors played into uh, the, the modest targets. But even then we were not able to achieve those targets. Um, I would like to to commit that when we have reached the 10% of the adult population, we shall then set fresh targets. But it is my hope and intention that we will meet these targets uh, before the close of the year, and then we'll be able to revise the targets and, and, and work our way to bigger numbers as it were. Um, the question on the strategy for vaccination, um, is, is an important one, and uh, the comment about the vaccination being voluntary is also important. Um, I, I want to ask the question that, that how many of us in our homes really have to have a gun to our head to do the right thing? I think that the strategic issue here is that an adult person needs information and this speaks to the last question that has been asked an adult person needs information and when they have processed that information they make decisions and those decisions are influenced by whether they are able to afford or access whatever decisions they make now in the context of covid as i said earlier unfortunately there have been a lot of myths and misconceptions Fast forward, early 20, if, if you go backwards, not, not fast forward, you go back, early 2020, when we started talking about COVID, the same individuals and group of people 
who are anti vaccines were in disbelief. How many of, of you uh, espouse the idea that COVID is not real? It's a disease for the West. And when the first wave passed, people, especially in our communities, were like, oh no, you see, we, we, we haven't had people dying as we've seen in the US until the third wave came. And when we started to talk vaccines and all kinds of myths and misconceptions have gone on from you will die or you know uh, you will be impotent or your child will never get uh, you, you'll never be able to bear a child etc etc colleagues here's the guidance if you have a health issue a health question ask your doctor don't go to social media because social media has not been qualified to give you answers on health matters so ask your doctor and they'll give you the correct information about whatever health question you have social media is not intended to give you medically correct uh, information so we are here ask us and we'll tell you the same way you trust us to, to treat whatever health condition is the same way we will be determined to do our best uh, to treat you in case you get uh, an infection or to prevent an infection. So, I think that in terms of the strategy, what is different now, and I need to zero in on this, what is different now is that we totally have a new leadership. We have a new leadership, and that leadership is very, very clear and categorical on the fact that this issue is now a national priority, this is not a partisan matter, and this is why everybody across party, across religion, across uh, affiliation is invited to the, to, the, to the leadership activity on COVID vaccination. So the very big game changer is the leadership. There's a difference in the leadership and the approach we are taking on this matter. And uh, there was a, a question around availability of vaccines. You will see that uh, when the, 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 the budget is announced, uh, there will be provisions in the national budget uh, for COVID fight. And that ought to say that they, they, they are taking this issue extremely seriously. Um, and so we hope that journalists and, and adult colleagues we will take responsibility on what information we transmit and what information we pass on to our neighbor, our friends, and that we can all work together and achieve uh, good vaccination numbers in order to uh, mitigate the fourth wave of COVID. Then we can focus on other things. At the moment, the COVID issue is a war, and we have to be careful like people who are under siege so that we can liberate ourselves and be able to function as a civilized society. Uh, thank you. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Dr. Chilengi. Clearly, COVID is on the mind of everyone, and I think with that, we all do have an incentive to go out and uh, get vaccinated. I think it's fair to say that is the only way that we are going to afford to keep the economy open, and up, and up and running, protect jobs, protect incomes, as well as protecting the welfare, well-being and livelihoods for our families. And uh, with that, ladies and gentlemen, uh, in terms of press, we would uh, like to close our press briefing. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you very much for tuning in at DevTech Media. Remember, DevTech Media is the media that shares news, trending videos, political news, gospel music as well as entertainment please don't forget to hit that subscription button and that notification bell to be the very first person to receive the video that will be produced and posted by devtech media devtech media updating you